Welcome to this meeting of Perth and North Council. Um, I'd like to particularly welcome those who are uh, joining in the room and online as members of the public. Um, there will be comfort breaks as required, and I'd like to ask the clerk to confirm any apologies and take a roll call of those joining online. Thank you, Provost. Um, we do not have any apologies this morning, but for those online, when I call out your name, could you please confirm you're present? Uh, Bailey Brock. Councillor Duff. Present. Councillor Illingworth. Present. Councillor James. Morning, Kirsten. Present. Councillor Reid. Present. And Bailey Williamson. Present. Thank you. All members are present. Thank you. Um, Members, item two is declarations of interest. Do many members have any declarations of interest in respect of today's business? I don't see any declarations of interest um, and therefore we will move on to item three, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Members, are we able to agree the minute of the previous meeting? Great, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sheena Devlin wishes to provide a point of clarification on the minute in relation to the CTLR naming. Thank you, Provost. Members, on page 8 of 42 of your pack in relation to the naming of the CTLR and the um, exercise that we will undertake with schools, it's to update Council that a great opportunity has arisen to combine this with some really exciting work that CPK are organising around um, history parks for schools in relation to the Stone of Destiny and its return to Perth and Kinross. And therefore, we felt it was appropriate to combine those two and to run the competition, the naming competition, concurrently with that work which will take place in the first term of the new academic year. And therefore, we will bring back the name of um, the preferred name from the young people to council in October at the meeting on the 4th of October. So it was just to update council to that effect. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Sheena. Uh, members, we now move on to item four, which is the outstanding business statement. Uh, are there any questions on the outstanding business statement? Are there questions in the outstanding business? Can we note the outstanding business statement? Thank you. Item 5.1 is uh, amendment standing order 9.1, um, and this will be moved by Councillor Peter Barrett. Councillor Peter Barrett. Um, thanks, Provost. Um, the proposed uh, um, amendment to standing order uh, 9.1 uh, was submitted um, at the previous meeting of the Council uh, in accordance with the standing orders uh, with regard to amendments to um, uh, standing orders and then it is uh, uh, decided today. It's a, a, a very um, small uh, adjustment to the uh, standing orders uh, which seeks to uh, bring uh, public proceedings of the licensing committee uh, into line with all other uh, public proceedings of the rest of the council committees uh, in that those uh, proceedings would then be made available uh, on online uh, via the council's YouTube channel or the council's um, website. Um, I'm very grateful uh, that uh, Councillor Lang uh, has uh, agreed to, 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 to second uh, the, the proposed amendment. Um, as I said, it removes a, a, an inconsistency. Um, I think it improves openness uh, and transparency. Um, I've had feedback from the officers that the concerns uh, which were held at the time that the uh, standing orders were uh, originally drafted um, uh, uh, no longer uh, apply. Uh, and I would be uh, very grateful for members' support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Councillor Lane to second the motion, please. Uh, thanks, Provost, and thanks to Councillor Barrett for uh, bringing this motion forward. Uh, it's sensible, uh, uh, minor revision to the standing orders, and I'm very happy to second it. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Point of clarification from Bailey Ahern. 
Thank you, Provost. Um, yeah, I've had a discussion with um, the head of legal and governance. It's just, um, it's implied in some committees that private papers will not be um, published. And I just want to know whether that needs to be put in there or not. No, the provisions around private papers will continue to be the same as they are set down in the local government act. Yeah, it's just not in there, so I don't want it to be uh, any Dubai team whether the wording should be in there. There is set on the private papers in relation in the standing orders and they would apply. OK. Are there any further comments on this item or can we agree it? Agreed. Thank you. Item 5.2, use of air travel within the United Kingdom. Councillor Lane to move the motion. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Provost. Um, the motion is there, it is uh, understand, uh, perfectly clear and understandable. I think for everyone, uh, this is more about um, making a statement that uh, we will use sustainable travel wherever we can and not use short haul flights where unless it's absolutely necessary um, uh, for for means of safeguarding or, or, or other uh, means where we have to use uh, uh, air travel to, to care for uh, people who fall into our care as a council. Local authority um, uh, fits in well with our uh, climate change and sustainability uh, committee and the, the, what we want to make a statement here and hopefully businesses etc will continue to use more sustainable travel. So without further ado, I'm happy to move this uh, paper. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Councillor Grant Stewart second the motion. Thank you, Provost. I'm before you to second this motion to reset the default on internal travel by reducing the use of internal flights within the UK by Perth and Kinross Council. I'm not here to sit and lecture you about um, carbon, as you're all very well aware of what's happening in our planet. However, any simple internet search will show you that flying is the biggest creator of harmful gases. We all know that rail transport creates less harmful gases. Flying at high altitude creates 254 grams per kilometer. Rail comes in at 213 grams less at 41 grams per kilometer. Not only have we got to think about the carbon reduction, which is part of our corporate mantra, uh, there are spin-offs. We have seven rail stations within Perth and Kinross. Uh, and I'm probably stretching a bit with uh, thinking about Granach Station, so apologies, Provost, Bailey Williamson and Councillor Duff. Um, I don't know how many, how many people commute from there. We have increasing use of electric buses in Perth, and only six days ago, many of us attended the Rural Transport Forum, where the Scottish Government grants were discussed and available to support businesses moving to reduce carbon. And of course, many of that infrastructure links with the rail network. By using the rail as our default, we're using local infrastructure. Using these assets means more local jobs. We could also consider that rail travel could be seen as an efficient cost of our time. No traveling and to distant airports with cars, but creating more carbon, check-in times, and people can start using rail network Wi-Fi connections to start meetings and conversations with colleagues. The rail network continues to move forward and plans were submitted to Perth and Kinross Council May last year for electrification of the rail line from Dunblane to Invergowrie. Of course, that moves on up to Aberdeen. Perth station itself was opened in 1878. Ten years before that, an exceptional Scotsman was born. In his time, John Muir was a student, business manager, philosopher, columnist, author and campaigner. He is revered in the United States of America. 
1980, the John Muir Trust was established in Scotland. Its headquarters are based in Pitlochry, and one of its land holdings is also in Perthshire, East Shehalyan. He had the foresight over a hundred years ago about man's relationship with our planet. He was part of leaving a legacy of national parks in America. We must now look at our own legacy that we leave. Pass this motion to play our part in reducing our carbon footprint. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grant Stewart. Um, we now have uh, a couple of points of clarification. First point of clarification is from Councillor Angus Forbes. Yeah, thanks, Provost. I, I want to just test the phrase uh, suitable travel, uh, train being the obvious alternative to flying. So I'm just wondering if the mover or seconder could suggest an answer to a situation perhaps where uh, an officer has a meeting in London, is going to take all day and going by train means an overnight uh, accommodation at both ends, um, having an impact perhaps on their social and family life, but more importantly, costing the council more money. What, what would be the situation that they would envisage uh, if that situation arose? The situation would be that they would take... Sorry, uh, Mr. Sorry. I hadn't quite called you yet there, but you may now answer the point of clarification. It would be that they would either have to take bus travel or train travel, take an overnight, uh, take the sleeper down or something. Because that is that is uh, suitable travel. The idea of is the if there's no other means of suitable travel uh, or more sustainable travel, i.e. bus or train because of strike action or uh, inclement weather that only uh, they'd be able to travel by air, then that would be uh, what I would uh, say would be an exception to the rule. Also, there would be an exception uh, if it was applied to care, welfare or safeguarding of our young people or, or any other uh, resident that we had to uh, transport back into Persia. OK, thank you. Councillor Kugali. Who will actually be making the judgment on an individual case basis? Mr. Leader. I would think that uh, could be left to the individual themselves. And if it became uh, that they wish to request it, they request it to their line manager or to the uh, strategic lead, I would think, by the time that this came round. Councillor Allen. Thank you. Um, just it, it, it follows on from the, the questions that have just been asked and answered, really. The use of air, which is going anyway, regardless of whether our officers use them or not, is the most efficient way to travel long distance, i.e. for a journey to London. Given our issues with budgetary constraints, trains for five hours each way will probably involve overnight stays, food, subsistence, etc. Sorry, sorry Councillor Allen, is this it's a... Also a gross, is it's this, also a gross... Is this a point of clarification or is this a comment? Well, it follows on, as I said, from the previous comments. So can, can we get to the point of clarification? I'm going to give you, yeah. It's also a gross inconvenience to the individual, two days away rather than one. Is it really necessary? That's the question I'm asking. I'm not entirely sure that's a point of clarification in terms of the text. I think that is more of a comment and a view. However, if the leader wishes to provide an answer, he may. Well, as a local authority in this administration and other members of the administration, um, we wish to make a statement that, yes, it may be slightly more inconvenient, but if we have no planet left to live on, that will be uh, more inconvenient for everyone. Thanks. Councillor Freshwater. Uh, thank you, Provost. It was just to ask, do we have an idea of how many flights are actually taken per annum by um, officials and elected members on uh, council business? Thank you. Mr. Leader, do you have any information on that regard? Uh, I don't have exact figures. I, I would imagine it's very few. This is a this is a statement to show that we are uh, leading the way as a, an organisation within Perth and Kinross, and hopefully with the publicity coming from this, uh, other businesses within Perth and Kinross will follow our lead rather than uh, uh, any um, great statement on the number of flights that we're doing. It's a, it's a statement of intent and that I think that everybody, if they read the the motion and try to understand it themselves would realise what we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. Councillor Forbes, you have an amendment. I do promise I've submitted it to committee services, so hopefully they can put it up on the screen for us. It's not particularly long, so I'll just wait a few seconds for people to read it. 
if you want to let me know when you're ready for me to comment. You may go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Provost. So uh, Councillor Lane's comments in the papers recently described a situation where he made a conscious decision to use the train rather than to fly. And I think that's a perfect situation where council officers and members can make good judgment for the right reasons. This proposal simply forces people to make decisions that may not be the right ones in a specific set of circumstances that we don't quite understand. Our officers and elected members are sensible adults who can be trusted to make the right decisions based on their own circumstances. And we should simply remind our officers and ourselves of our commitment to climate change when making travel decisions. This is gesture politics, won't make any difference. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, do you have a second? Oh, sorry, Councillor Fresh. What? Sorry. Uh, thank you, Provost. Yeah, I think just to, to second the comments that um, uh, Councillor Forbes has made, and I, I do support the underlying reasons for this motion, for the uh, original motion uh, to reduce our climate emissions and so on. But I do think just for the the, the, the potential unintended consequences of, of extra travel time required, of expense and so on, um, it, it does tie the hand a little bit of, of the councils and the individuals. So I think we can make the statement through through the amended motion, uh, and I would uh, commend that. Thank you, Provost. OK, thank you very much. Are there any further comments on this? Councillor Bob Brown. Thanks, uh, <coughs> thanks, Provost. Um, and I too understand the sentiment behind this motion, but it does seem to me a little bit pointless to place before Council, particularly given we cannot control scheduled air flights, which will fly anyway whether or not officers or elected members are on board. And this action will have absolutely no effect in, on trying to reach net zero, which we as a council are aiming to do, because the flights will still be going. Surely the, the decision as to which form of travel to use should be down to relative cost and or, if necessary, personal choice. Budgetary requirements, given the times we're in, should be paramount. Uh, we are all aware of the changes in our climate and the, the, the issues that raises. But the solutions will not come from pointless and irrelevant actions such as this. They, we can't stop air, air flights, so they will still go ahead and that carbon emissions will still occur. And we should also bear in mind, of course, that fuel for air travel is changing. Uh, there are potential changes coming. Uh, so I was happy to support the amendment in this case. Thank you, Councillor Braun. Councillor Tom Kuhn. Thank you, Provost. I think what this amendment to the motion demonstrates is that Conservatives are only interested in money, not the climate, and they're just a bunch of greenwashers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McEwen. Deputy Provost. Thank you, Raj. I, I just want to address the comment that the flights will be going anyway. Um, recent improvements to the rail service between Edinburgh and London have resulted, I think, in something like 30 or 40 percent of transfer from air to um, rail. Um, the opening of the Channel Tunnel has over time reduced short haul from Heathrow to Paris by 85 percent and the direct rail services from London to Brussels and Amsterdam are beginning to have a similar effect on, on that sort of travel. So it's simply not true um, that the airlines will be going anyway and the airlines are modifying their timetables to meet what passengers are choosing. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Councillor Liz Barrett. Thank you, Provost. I will be supporting the motion as presented by uh, councillors Ling and Stewart. Uh, we do need to take strong and effective action on climate change and reduction in air flights. Sorry, in, in re reducing flights will impact even in a minor way on the weight being carried by planes and it'll help to reduce the demand and shift people more towards and support the rail network which has improved as Councillor Parrott has pointed out. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Barrett. Councillor John Rebeck. Thanks Provost. I very much support the very specific objectives of the original motion. Uh, climate does come before money so I'll be supporting the original motion. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Rebeck. Councillor Waters. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Provost. Uh, the, 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 this motion has a clear, a clear uh, idea to set out what, what as as an organisation we would like to uphold, to, and that is over sustainable travel. And when there is the opportunity to take train, it works. In a previous uh, employment, I quite frequently went down to London 
uh, many years ago and realised that rather than getting up at three, four in the morning to catch an early morning train down to London, attend whatever workplace I was in, it was actually better catching an overnight sleeper. You were rested, you arrived early in the morning, uh, fully rested, and you could then do the day's work and get back home in the same in, in, in the same day. I'm also really concerned with the, some of the comments about the planes will also will, will just be arriving at, uh, uh, flying anyway. You know, so so we don't have to make any effort within our choices on sustainable transport because because it's already going to just say there this this kind of attitude over the climate change and over carbon footprints. I think I think is very very concerning. Uh, and and given the the Conservatives uh, at Westminster uh, changing the the duty on flights for local flights uh, clearly set out uh, as do the comments today by the Conservatives on their attitude to to uh, sustainable transport. Thank you, uh, Councillor Welch. Uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, unfortunately, it's grey old privileged men who are going to be least impacted by the climate change and uh, our young people are, are looking to us for um, not just uh, signals of intent, but actions. And I think this is just a signal of intent, but it, it is very important to align to the actions that this council has got to take. And uh, I, I, I'm just uh, uh, very disappointed that uh, uh, some of the comments that have come with regards to uh, planes that are already flying, etc. That's just completely inappropriate in the emergency they're facing. Thank you. Councillor Kogali. I'd just say that given ES1 has done almost 3000 miles since the beginning of this term, I'd suggest that this is almost entirely performative and if not that slightly hypocritical. Just on the point of ES1, um, I have used ES1 less than 11 months than previous provost used in the last month of the last term. So uh, if we're taking climate um, education, I don't think it will be from that side of the chamber. Thank you. Councillor Illingworth. Oh, thank you, provost. The, the Cabinet Secretary for Constitutional Affairs at, at the Holyrood Parliament often goes abroad unnecessarily on matters that are not within the remit of the Scottish Parliament according to the Scotland Act 1998. Will um, this administration do what it can to persuade the Cabinet Secretary to spend less time on planes? OK, I think we're going to move on to uh, Councillor Forbes. Do you wish to sum up? Uh, yes, Provost, I do. Thank you. Um, I do take offence at Councillor, I think it was Councillor McEwen's comment about money. It was a, a completely pointless comment, unsurprisingly. But my point is simply that our officers can make good decisions without us having to tell them. I trust our officers and our elected members to make the right decisions. Uh, it's very sad if some other people in this chamber don't have the same level of trust in them as I do. Councillor Ling, do you wish to sum up? Yes, yeah, so I'll sum up. Um, I think this is a continuation of the last administration on climate change of do nothing. And I think the Provost ES1 did 17,000 miles um, in the last 11 months of the, uh, the previous administration. Um, we set and trained the Provost and myself to have a, an electric vehicle which has finally been delivered uh, this week and we've, uh, we'll be getting out the lease of the old uh, it's a hybrid vehicle, uh, a minibus type. So I think we set the agenda with having a climate change and sustainability committee, um, which was a uh, Councillor Kogali and that had a lot of um, pushback against, I think, when he was on at the first meeting or two, but seems to be buying into it. Now, I think this is the next natural step in moving forward, and I commend the motion, the motives behind it, and uh, we will uh, always keep moving onwards instead of the same old, same old from the Conservative opposition. Thank you. Um, we can move to the roll call, please. Thank you, Provost. Um, we are now on motion 5-2, use of air travel within the UK. We have a motion by Councillor Lane, seconded by Councillor Grant Stewart, that the Council agrees that representatives of Perth and Cross Council, whether officers, elected members or other staff, will not use air travel within the UK mainland for business travel purposes unless there is other, um, no means of suitable travel available to them. 
we have an amendment by Councillor Forbes, seconded by Councillor Freshwater, that the Council agrees that representatives of Perth and Cumnos Council, whether offices, elected members or other staff, will consider our climate change objectives when deciding what means of transport they use for business travel. Um, in line with uh, Section 21 of the Standing Orders, we will now go to a roll call vote. When I call out your name, can you please let me know if you're voting for the motion or the amendment? Bailey Ahern. Amendment. Councillor Allen. Amendment. Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Bailey Bailey. Motion. Councillor Les Barrett. Motion. Councillor Peter Barrett. Motion. Councillor Braun. Motion. Uh, sorry, amendment. Uh, Bailey Brock. Motion. Councillor Carr. Motion. Councillor Chan. Councillor Cuthbert. Motion. Councillor Donaldson. Motion. Councillor Drysdale. Motion. Councillor Duff. Amendment. <clears throat> Councillor Forbes. Amendment. Councillor Frampton. Motion. Councillor Freshwater. Amendment. Councillor Harvey. Motion. Councillor Ellingworth. Amendment. Councillor James. Same old amendment. Councillor Kigali. Amendment. Councillor Lane. Motion. Councillor Leishman. Motion. Councillor McPherson. Motion. Councillor Massey. Order Planet. Motion. Councillor McCall. Motion. Provost McDade. Motion. Councillor McEwen. Bailey McLaren. Motion. Deputy Provost Parrott. Motion. Councillor Rebeck. Motion. Councillor Reid. Amendment. Councillor Robertson. Motion. Councillor Shires. Amendment. Councillor Smith. Amendment. Councillor Colin Stewart. Motion. Councillor Grant Stewart. Motion. Councillor Waters. Uh, definitely the motion. Councillor Welch. Motion. And Bailey Williamson. Motion. We have 26 votes for the motion and 14 for the amendment. The motion carries. Thank you. Item 5.3, ending Roma Gypsy Travellers hate discrimination. I'm going to ask Councillor Frampton to move the motion. Thank you, Provost. I think the motion's on the screen. I just want to bring to your attention that there was a type and error in the motion where it should say social exclusion instead of social inclusion. I welcome the Gypsy Travellers Awareness Month that's taken place this month. The fact that these awareness days is needed in Perth and Kinross in the year 2023 only reinforces the importance of how much this motion is needed. As a young child growing up, I was aware, as many of you might have been, about the hate and discrimination aimed at the Gypsy Travellers communities from others. This has worsened over the years with the use of social media, where hateful racial discriminatory remarks are made, are able to be spread worldwide at the touch of a button. The effects of hate and discrimination are felt within the Roma Gypsy and Traveller communities. They still face many disadvantages in society, such as access to public services, education, housing and health and social care. Statistics show us that because of these inequalities, the Gypsy Traveller communities have high rates of anxiety and depression, suicides and infant mortality. They also have a lower life expectancy and there is a declining older population within the Gypsy Travellers. If we are ever to achieve living in a society 
where everyone is treated with care, dignity and respect, then all racial hate and discrimination needs to be challenged and eliminated. Only then will we have a fair, equal society that not one group, community or individual is at disadvantage by. This motion will be in line with the National Plan Improving the Lives of Gypsy Travellers 2019-21, which is to provide more accommodation, improve access to public services and improve Gypsy Traveller representation across Perth and Kinross. Please agree the motion. Thank you, Councillor Frampton. Councillor Tom McEwen to second the motion, please. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Frampton for bringing this motion to Council. I think it does her a great credit and I think her uh, people in this chamber and her family should be proud of her for wanting to champion this group within her community. A group that she has, has already highlighted seems to be the last to be discriminated against because of how they want to live. There are others in this chamber who have for years, even prior to myself becoming a councillor, championed the Gypsy Traveller community and Councillor Peter Barrett needs commendation for the work that he has done and the things he has said in the past and hopefully the things he will say today on this matter. We had the Gypsy Roma Traveller History Month across in the Civic Hall last week, which I had a look around and it demonstrated that during the First and Second World War that the Gypsy Traveller community contributed to the defence of this country suffered the same problems with PTSD, then known as shell shock and other issues that normal or ordinary soldiers or people who lived in solid houses uh, had. And I think this goes unrecognised within our communities. So again, I'd like to applaud this motion coming forward and I can only see it being unanimously accepted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCune. I have Councillor Peter Barrett to comment first. Um, thanks, Provost. Uh, earlier this morning, almost 300 Muslim men, women and children uh, gathered in this building to mark uh, Eid al-Adha. Uh, I was pleased to welcome them to the Civic Hall with a traditional greeting, uh, Eid Mubarak, along with David McFree from the Equalities team. And I want to commend the Council on providing our facilities for prayer, uh, which I think is another tangible and visible uh, demonstration of this Council's commitment to inclusion uh, and equalities. Um, Provost, I'm very happy to support the motion and thank Councillors Frampton uh, and uh, McEwen for bringing it forward uh, and adding their voices to the growing number of local leaders who prepared to stand up for gypsy travellers in Perth and Kinross and in Scotland. Uh, I recently attended a COSLA Local Leaders Network event for councillors uh, and was amazed that there were over 100 people at the event, including a very good number from Perth and Kinross. Uh, championing the rights of gypsy travellers in Perth and Kinross hasn't been a crowded political field, so it's great to find new and welcome new allies. I attended uh, the premiere of uh, Perth Parrots Football Club uh, video uh, entitled Every Time We Play We Win. Uh, Perth Parrots, for anyone who doesn't know, are, are an LGBTQI plus inclusive sports club uh, and on the evidence of last Friday are so much more as well. Um, the Parrots coach Ruri Fleming gave what I thought was the most compelling and inspiring presentation on minority communities uh, need for mainstream allies and on people like us using our privileged positions as a force for good and for changing attitudes. Uh, and the best part about what Rudy had to say was that it isn't difficult. In fact, he said it's easy. You just have to do it to challenge hate and prejudice and discrimination. Put yourself in the place of people experiencing discrimination and ask them intelligent questions and follow their advice. With real commitment and leadership from officers across a variety of services, including housing, environment services, education, planning and equalities, and with outside organisations and partners such as MECOP, COSLA, Assurances and the Red Card, we have as a council made significant progress in the last six years with our Gypsy Traveller Strategy and Action Plan now incorporated into our housing strategy. We were one of the few Scottish councils to lead the negotiated stopping pilot during COVID and have committed to create a new transit site at Arran Road, which will end decades of unsatisfactory ad hoc responses. 
but investing in the double dike site and we'll be replacing all the chalets on site. And at long last, we are starting to review, review rents now that the site has been transferred to the housing revenue account with the aim of eliminating poverty. Tackling stigma and racism is a huge challenge and this motion is one important and easy step for us all to take. So please support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Delia Hearn. Thank you very much, Provost. Um, I agree with the motion and the sentiments behind it. And we have just had um, Gypsy Traveller Awareness Month. Um, we've also just had so, show racism the red card in this chamber, which deplores all forms of racism and discrimination, which is what we all, I hope, agree on. We are, however, singling out a particular group in this motion, and we should be supporting any and all groups that are the target of discriminatory abuse, regardless of colour, faith and ethnic background or gender, all the time without highlighting one particular group at this instance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Delia Hearn. Members, are we then content to agree the motion? Thank you very much, members. Um, we now move on to item 5.4. Uh, point of order, Councillor Lane. Thanks, uh, Provost. It actually relates to uh, paper 5.4 and 5.5, and it's on the competency of uh, basically demanding that I meet um, various organisations or individuals. Um, I have no problem if if it was a request, because my concern is I cannot make somebody meet me. I've been waiting to meet Dahina Davison, the levelling up uh, minister for, for several months to, and had two meetings cancelled at the last minute, one virtually at the last minute. So uh, I, I, my worry is that if, if I can't meet somebody because they're unable to meet me, uh, then I uh, would, would I then be not upholding the will of the council? I think always before there was a request to seek a request a meeting, but th this happened in the last uh, council meeting we had regarding the A9 uh, road improvements, where I managed to meet with my uh, colleagues and we discussed the way the letter should be written requesting a meeting. So I'm asking if it's competent in both these motions to uh, for me to be demanding a meeting, uh, which I cannot fulfil obviously. Um, so I would ask for that. And also, it's very strange to see the chief executive included in both these, which are basically political meetings. And I don't think it, it, it's uh, right and proper that the chief executive should be involved in political meetings um, and uh, uh, have political involvement. Uh, I don't think that's his role. So uh, I'd like you to rule on both these points, please. Um, Thank you, Mr. Leader. Obviously, uh, we cannot and nobody can be forced to do anything against their will. Um, and therefore, um, it would perhaps be helpful in terms of ensuring um, people are comfortable around the wording if the movers of the respective motions agree to tweak the wording around making it a request um, and perhaps also to remove the chief executive, because I do agree that it is a political meeting by the looks of it, rather than um, an officer to officer meeting. Um, there are obviously Councillor Duff, Bailey Ahern and Councillor Shires. Um, would you be inclined to tweak the wording to reflect that? Uh, Provis, uh, as far as I'm aware, <clears throat> obviously this has been submitted and, and, and ruled to be competent or it wouldn't be before us uh, this morning. Um, I, I certainly understand and appreciate that you can only request a meeting and if the uh, Cabinet Secretary is unwilling or unable to meet with you, then I'm happy to hear back to that effect. Um, so, you know, as far as requesting a meeting with the Cabinet Secretary is concerned, uh, it certainly doesn't say demand a meeting, uh, but I'm happy to clarify that uh, obviously a, a request should be made to meet with the Cabinet Secretary. And as I say, if that's uh, forthcoming or not, then the leader can, leader can report back at a future meeting. Um, as far as the 
uh, involvement with the chief executive concerned. As I say, I think that is competent, or else it would have been um, ruled incompetent by, by legal services, would be my understanding, and perhaps uh, Lisa could confirm the, the situation uh, before any further comment, please. So I think just to be clear, Councillor Duff, um, the convener rules on competency. However, the legal and governance staff uh, determine whether they think something is technically competent in advance to allow it on the agenda. However, the ruling on competency actually comes at the meeting. So at the moment, I will, I'm considering competency on that basis. I think it is broadly competent. I was really asking if you would be minded to reflect that request. Um, which I think is not an unreasonable one. Um, I'm I'm happy to reflect on it at the moment, uh, Provost, um, and I'll make um, a final decision perhaps at, at the end of the debate, if that's in order. So the head of legal governance is going to clarify, I think, particularly in the position of the chief executive's inclusion. Thank you. Morning, Councillor Duff. Um, ordinarily, where we see references to officers and political motions, we do normally try to, um, we do suggest that that's removed and, and officers are not involved. This is, these two have, have basically slipped through the net and there's apologies from legal and governance from that. If we'd picked it up, we probably would have suggested deleting the reference to the chief executive, but you are correct, it is technically competent. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, in which case I'm happy to remove the reference to the Chief Executive. OK, thank you, Councillor Duff. Um, and Bailey Hearn, Councillor Shires, are you also content in respect of your respective motions in that respect? Thank you. OK, um, I think the rest of the motion, in my view, is competent on that basis on what we have just agreed and therefore we can discuss this item. I am, I am aware that a very similar item was discussed at length at the Housing and Social Wellbeing Committee last week and therefore it is my intention to limit contributions to one per political group um, because I understand that there was wide consensus at that meeting um, and therefore I don't think it is the best use of the Council's time to basically discuss something the Council has already discussed. Um, so, Councillor Duff, I'd like to call on you to mm -hmm. uh, open your motion. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost. <clears throat> uh, with the memory of, of our budget process still fresh in everyone's minds, there's no need to tell this Council about the difficulties which arise from receiving a flat cash budget settlement from the Scottish Government for the next four years. <clears throat> Members will clearly remember the absolute anguish felt by every local authority in Scotland and the many calls for additional government funding, which were made before some additional funding was forthcoming. The motion before us today highlights the consequences of that same decision for the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, needing to make £36 million of cuts over the next four years, including £11 million in 2023-24. The Fire and Rescue Service states that the current model is unsustainable. As a result, it has been forced to propose the removal of 10 pumps from across Scotland, including one of the three pumps currently based in Perth City's only fire station, with effect from the 1st of September this year. We are told that this will be a temporary cut to service. However, this comes at a time when whole time operational firefighters across Scotland have fallen by nearly 600 in the last 10 years and by 11, over 1100 when you take retained control room and support officers into consideration. This situation is compounded by the ever increasing response times for emergency call outs, which have been steadily getting worse year and year ever since the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service was centralised in 2013. Provost, earlier this month, members will recall that there was a fire in a rural 
rural house near St Meadows. This incident required all three pumps and the high platform appliance from Perth and two appliances from Dundee to be called out. Thankfully, no one was at home at the time of the fire, but despite the best efforts of the fire and rescue service, the house was totally destroyed. <clears throat> Perth Fire Station is our only full-time fire station. Frequently, full-time crews can be redeployed to areas where there are insufficient retained or volunteer firefighters available and the local pump has had to go off duty. Other than the city of Perth, Perth and Kinross is covered by 10 retained and three volunteer crews and a reduction in full-time appliance cover will also have a significant impact on the, this type of cover across our rural areas. Fewer fire appliances and fewer firefighters mean our communities are at greater risk. These proposals to reduce fire cover in Perth will undoubtedly increase the risk, not just to communities, but to all our firefighters across Perth and Conross. Provost, none of us want to see firefighter or public safety compromised, I'm sure. We all want to see those who keep us safe protected. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service needs an end to underfunding. It needs increased investment and the people of Perth and Conross need to see some action from the Scottish Government to deliver that investment. I understand that the fire service needs an investment of £500 million to bring its infrastructure up to scratch. Sufficient funds to reverse these cuts would be a start. The Fire Brigade Union has stated that there is no hiding place for elected members. Provost, this council will not hide from its responsibilities. As representatives of the people and firefighters of Perth and Conross, I call upon members to register their serious concerns at these drastic proposals and to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Peely Ahern to second, please. Thank you, Provost. This Council receives quarterly briefings, annual reports and has regular consultations with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and they receive from us as elected members our support, as well as receiving regular questions on their performance. I acknowledge and support the motion at Housing and Social Wellbeing last week presented by Councillor Leishman and his highlighting of the possible likely scenarios that could occur from the reduction in appliances and personnel. This motion gives our firefighters our support to the cuts that the Scottish Government are imposing on them. Our public services across the board have been cut and it's only a matter of time before these are serious consequences as already highlighted and cutting manpower and or appliances from our frontline firefighters increase that risk. I'm aware there is an operational decision based on their budget cuts, but there is an increased risk, not only for our communities, and but for the firefighters, which we represent. And as such, we need to make sure that this council does what it can to highlight this risk, which is why we want to go further and are asking the leader of the council to speak to the cabinet secretary to di directly to highlight these issues and ask that they reverse the cuts. I'm happy to second this motion. Thank you, Bailey Ahern. I have Councillor Tom McEwen uh, with a comment. Thank you, Provost. Having discussed this at Housing and Social Wellbeing with the motion from Councillor Leishman, agreed a councillor briefing for all councillors so that we can all explore these matters. I've also spoken to senior officers when I was at a, an award ceremony in Forfar for the fire service and reiterated to them that information regarding these changes had not truly become forthcoming in the appropriate manner. And this, they agreed to that and they agreed that going forward the information about any changes uh, will be better. They also agreed that the changes that have been made so far cannot be permanent. They can only be agreed through public consultation. So there's another process to come into line until any of these changes can be made permanent by the fire service. I've also spoken to Councillor Maureen Chalmers when I was down at COSLA on Monday. She's a spokesperson for the community wellbeing, which has the responsibility at COSLA for overviewing the fire service. She herself is meeting with senior fire officers again to discuss these changes across the national boundaries. Her own ward, her own council area is affected by similar reduction in fire appliances. And she's going to take that take that forward to bring a meeting for COSLA communities members so that each council can be represented in discussion with these senior officers. 
I fail to see what this motion is achieving other than schoolroom politics. Discussions regarding the fire service should follow the agreed process with the public, with the unions, with COSLA and with senior fire officers. This motion is not helpful, doesn't positively contribute to these important discussions. The Tory group's motions to Council this year, the focus on parliamentary politics, demonstrates in some way a, a veiled support for this administration at the Council as we fight inflation-induced poverty and hardship. As a minority administration over the last 14 months, we have at every turn strived to work with other groups to take forward consensus. Who is missing from this consensual approach? Who are the separatists in this chamber? Who's, who is driving division? I'm sorry to say it's a Tory group with their divisive motions and their divisive agenda. Every, last week at Health and Social Wellbeing, our last paper was regarding the SIF fund and participatory budgeting. Prior to that paper being published, I took amendments from across the political groups and edited that paper. At the committee itself, there were three amendments brought forward to the paper, which we negotiated and changed. We are working as best as we can to work in collaboration with every group across this chamber to bring consensual politics for the people of Perth and Kinross. I think it's a shame that here at Full Council we should be discussing this issue. Our constituents face real challenges and we have our own responsibilities. We are wasting our time and are forcing officers to sit through what I feel is pseudo parliamentary gaslighting. Thank you. Billy Billy. Thank you, Provost. Provost, looking at this motion today, I think we need to get trading standards down here because this looks like a cheap knockoff of a motion we heard only last week. If the Conservatives truly believed this stuff, and they must have done because this motion must have been in a week prior, they could have brought these things and amended my colleague Councillor Eastman's motion. This is really just grandstanding. Firefighters will find the Tories to be strange allies today, but likely they'll welcome solidarity from any quarter. To attach some, attach some data to this situation, in England, 9,000 firefighters were lost from 2010 to 2021. That's a 20% cut in firefighters. Over a slightly different period from 2011 to 2021, Scotland only received a 14% cut. So I'm therefore really glad we're sending for someone from the SNP to petition the Cabinet Secretary, because I feel if we sent a Tory, they might just give them tips on, to cut, on how to cut the fire service harder and faster in Scotland. That said, I fully support the motion. I'm happy to work with any party that will challenge public sector cuts. Thank you. Thank you, Bailey Bailey, Councillor Braun, and then Councillor Peter Barrett, and then I'm coming to summing up. Thank you, uh, Provost. <clears throat> last, last week, a fellow member, Councillor Leishman, put forward a motion regarding operational cuts to the fire service to the Housing and Social Wellbeing Committee, and did so in the presence of several firefighters. That we are now discussing a further motion Although different, proves to all, including our firefighters, how concerned this council is with these proposed cuts, which includes the loss of one appliance from Perth. This has potentially serious consequences, not just for Perth, but for all other towns, such as Blairgowry, a retained station, which may have to rely on support in a major incident. All of us know of the dedication of the members of the fire service in protecting the people of Perth and Gunross, often putting themselves in harm's way to do so. Therefore, they need and should have all necessary equipment to fulfil that task. I appreciate that this decision has not been taken lightly and statistical information has been used to support the decisions made. However, none of us know what the future may bring and public safety should not be at the mercy of statistical information, which is historic anyway. Provost, I'm happy to support this motion as I was the previous one last week. But let us be clear, this situation is not the fault of the fire service. The fault lies with the Scottish Government, whose continual underinvestment in the fire service during this, their tenure in the government has culminated in the current budget shortfall of 36.5 million. No matter the cries from government sources throwing out figures detailing how much has been invested, it is clearly not enough. The first priority of good government and I stress good government, is the safety and security of its citizens. This is an important motion and I'm happy to support it. And I may add that public safety is not grandstanding. It's an important factor and we need to be safe and our citizens need to be safe. 
And finally, as I did then, I'll say it again, I would like to take the opportunity of thanking all our firefighters for their service to us and their dedication to their duty. Thank you, Provost. Okay, and Councillor Peter Barrett. Um, thanks, Provost. Uh, I'm fully in support of uh, this uh, motion. I was, as I was with the similar motion that went to uh, Housing and Social Wellbeing Committee uh, last week. Um, I still have real safety concerns as to what the impact of these cuts will be and uh, what it will mean to the functionalities and capabilities of uh, fire and rescue services in Perth and Kinross uh, and to mobilisation and responsiveness. Um, at the heart of these changes is the Scottish Government's budget, their gross financial and economic mismanagement and skewed budget priorities. And I think it is important that we stand up for our communities and express solidarity with the firefighters and support for their campaign in this chamber. And that campaign needs to be taken to Holyrood. This motion perhaps does that more explicitly uh, than the, the, the previous one. People in Perth and Kinross are rightly concerned about what the loss uh, of the fire appliance at Perth Station will mean, particularly for response times to fires in remote parts of our area. The Scottish Government needs to face up to the fact that the fire service is being forced to make these damaging decisions because of the restrictions placed on their budget. This is something that councillors need to make a noise about, and we should all agree that the more noise, the better. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Um, I have a point of order from Councillor Leishman. Thank you very much, Provost. Um, I completely appreciate what you said earlier on at the start about uh, one comment per political group, um, but I have been referenced uh, quite a few times in the, the course of the debate, and I was wondering if I could request a right to reply and comment on the motion, please. Uh, yes, since you have been referenced several times, I will let you have a right to reply. Thank you very much, Provost. I appreciate that. As Council is aware, I brought a motion uh, to the Housing and Social Wellbeing Committee last week, one that stated that we note with grave concern the operational decision of SFRS to decommission an appliance at Perth and Kinross Station. Request a meeting with the SFRS decision makers and representatives of the local service with elected members and provide reassurance to the SFRS of the Council's continued commitment to working together with them. At the meeting, the motion received unanimous support and we will have the chance of a dialogue with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. And I hope that as one voice, we will put forward the case for Perth to not be a victim of the life-threatening cuts that are scheduled for September. I say one voice and it's important because this must be a topic that transcends party politics. I said in the meeting last week that we shouldn't be distracted from the thing that actually matters that people from every community in Perth and Kinross will be in danger if Perth's fire service is reduced. Buildings will be destroyed and lives will be lost. Now, I know that both of these governments' record on what they've done to the fire service in Scotland and England is utterly contemptible and deserves the most severe of criticism, but time is really of the essence. These cuts are due to happen from the 4th of September and we need to be a unified, dignified and organised voice of protest because that is what our residents in all 12 wards, across all 12 wards and all communities deserve. Finally, to finish on, I would like also to send a message of solidarity to our firefighters here in Perth and the firefighters and the residents of Mary Hill, Govan and Cowcardens in Glasgow, to Hamilton, Greenock and to our near neighbours in Dundee, Dunfermline, Glenrothes, Kirkcaldy and Methil. Like us, People from those places are facing the prospect of cuts to their fire service that will endanger their communities. I wish them well in the shared fight to prevent these cuts. And although solidarity and support is all I can extend, they have every bit of it, because an injury to one is an injury to all. Thank you, Provost. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to come to Councillor Duff to sum up. Sorry, Provost, I missed that. Was that myself? Yes, I'm coming to you to sum up, Councillor Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Provost. <coughs> I'm sure members are well aware of the increased, increased risk which these cuts will mean for our firefighters, residents and businesses. Firefighters are only too willing to put themselves in harm's way for our protection. And I think it's time for us to pay them back by supporting the protection of our firefighters. I'm grateful to members for supporting the, this motion. Uh, to support our hard press uh, fire and rescue service. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Members, can we agree the motion? 
Thank you. Members, we now move on to item 5.5. Five. This is a motion by councillors John Duff and Councillor Shires on the University of Hazen Islands, Perth. Uh, before I ask Councillor Duff to speak, I see there is a point of order on motion 5.5 five from Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Provost. Uh, I'd like to query the factual accuracy of this motion and therefore its competence in its current form. Is it, <clears throat> is it not the case that the motion should call on the leader, uh, not, the, not the chief executive as we've established, to request to meet the principal of the University of Highlands and Islands, Vicky Nairn, rather than the cabinet secretary for education and skills, as it is UHI that decides the level of funding that it allocates to Perth UHI. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Drysdale. Yes, it is my understanding that um, the college budget is allocated by the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, that was a change that was brought in during the college regionalisation process when the university became the uh, further education uh, regional board. Uh, and I speak as someone who at one point briefly served on it. Um, and therefore the cuts have come through, uh, presumably certainly been passed on by the university um, and any cuts to the university would have come through the Scottish Funding Council. I'll take a minute just to reread the terms of the motion in regard to your point of order to see whether I think it is currently competent in its current format.
Members, we're going to take a few minutes recess to uh, determine this. OK, my ruling is that the terms of the motion are broad enough to be interpreted in a way that indicates the overall budget cut has come from uh, the Scottish Government. However, it may be accurate that the university has determined the level of cut, but the terms of the motion are broad enough that do make it accurate and they're enough to be debated and therefore it is competent. And therefore, I will invite Councillor Duff to move the motion. <coughs> Thank you, Provost. <clears throat> uh, along with Bailey Ahern, I recently met with the principal of the University of Highlands and Islands Perth <clears throat> to hear about the financial challenges which the university is experiencing. UHI Perth, in common with all of the sector, has received a flat cash settlement for 2023-24 and is also having to make a 10% cut to their credit uh, targets. The flat cash settlement comes at a time when costs have significantly increased and has resulted in the need for our university to make three million pounds savings to make ends meet. These cuts will potentially result in the loss of 50 jobs across all levels of staffing at the university, 50 job losses which this city can ill afford. The reduction in credit targets by 10% means that the university will be able to teach fewer students at a time when the demand for further education courses and skills training is continuing to grow. Our corporate plan has a priority of enabling our children and young people to achieve their full potential, to be well educated and to promote lifelong learning. It also acknowledges better education as a factor in tackling poverty. The three million cuts, the sorry, the three million pound cuts, the job losses and the reduction in students is therefore disastrous for UHI Perth, for the city of Perth and for our young people, uh, sorry, and for our people young and old. And this council should support UHI Perth in its call for a better deal. Currently UHI Perth staff are taking part in industrial action due to unresolved pay demands for 2022-23 and for 23-24. The Scottish Government has advised that no support will be given in terms of the university's outstanding pay negotiations, when many other parts of the public sector have received additional government assistance. Sadly, this situation was compounded when the Scottish Government cut £26 million from the college sector and £20 million from the university sector to pay for the local government teacher pay award. Currently, staff are refusing to make uh, mark coursework until the pay negotiations are settled. But with no financial assistance, it is difficult to see how this matter can be resolved without further cuts being made to staff or courses. In addition, an inability to pay competitive salaries could result in some staff moving on to other positions. Members will recall the outcry at the possibility of the UHI nursery closing Thankfully, the situation has currently been averted and I'm grateful to this council for trying to assist the university in maintaining a nursery at UHI Perth. However, the hard fact of life is that the nursery loses money and should it close, this would have a further devastating effect on staff and students. UHI Perth has a successful working partnership with Perth and Kinross Council and being parochial for a moment, I was thankful to find out that the problems which the university is facing will not impact on the Highland Perth Share Learning Partnership and its partnership with uh, Pitlochry High School. One further factor in the budget deficit is the top slice which UI takes from its universities and colleges towards the delivery of higher education provision. This is calculated on a percentage of the income from UHI Perth students and was £4.8 million for academic year 21-22. No figures are available for 22-23, but it is likely to be of a similar or higher amount. 
The financial consequences of the failure to fund UHI Perth is a significant cut to teaching staff at all levels, the loss of a number of courses from the curriculum and a reduction in the overall number of students who can find a place at UHI Perth. This will have a detrimental impact for further education in the city of Perth, and I believe it is incumbent on this council to express our serious concerns at these consequences. I'm therefore asking the leader to meet with the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills to express the council's concerns for UHI Perth and to call for additional funding uh, to prevent these job loss losses and course cuts and to seek financial assistance to help UHI Perth to settle the outstanding pay awards. Thank you, Provost. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Duff. Um, Councillor Shires to second the motion, please. Thank you, Provost. Um, if I may preface my comments, Provost, if, if that's OK with you, uh, thanking you for your, your ruling about this uh, motion, um, which I, I know with your background uh, through uh, UHI Perth will have a personal um, uh, bearing for you. Um, but it was more about the, the process within which we saw in this chamber a, a little cabal gathering on the left of the chamber um, without an invitation being extended to the mover and seconder of the motion to see if there was any that anything we might uh, uh, amend on our motion having just been lectured uh, by other elected members about the way that this council is an inclusive um, council and I just think maybe that could be reflected um, in people's thoughts over the summer recess so if you just bear with me on that one Professor and I'll move on to my comments. Just just on that point um, I am happy to apologise uh, on behalf of the group of us who were gathered over there. I wanted to speak to Councillor Drysdale to understand what the very specific parts of his point were before considering it and as you know I then did consider it and come uh, reflect my decision to you before I announced it publicly but um, I appreciate the point and certainly in the future will ensure that um, an invite is extended. And I appreciate that, Provost, and I'm very grateful for your backwards forwards understanding of our standard standing orders, which ensures the business of the council runs so smoothly. And um, moving on to my comments, in my time as a councillor, I've always been hugely impressed by the partnership between UHI Perth and the council. The shared focus on improving education and skills, helping develop opportunities for people of all ages and from all backgrounds. Importantly, serving residents from all parts of our council area to improve their opportunities through education and skills and accessing employment. We're all aware of the creative approach, approaches taken, such as the Highland Perthshire Learning Partnership, uh, to work together to address gaps in skills in areas such as social care. There was nationwide outcry from the higher and further education sector when £46 million was removed from their budgets with no warning earlier this year. And this has just added to the problems of underfunding of the sector. This against another bumper budget underspend from the Scottish Government in the last financial year. Far from pseudo -par parliamentary gaslighting, language which Councillor McHugh and I find very disappointing, I believe this motion is important and I would welcome Councillor Lane doing all he can to encourage the Cabinet Secretary to look again at how financial support can be given to this sector. Elected members will be aware of the important work being done through the Anti-Poverty Task Force and our cross-party ambition to help residents out of poverty into work and into better paying employment. Having opportunities to improve education and skills is a key part of this and we all want to do and, and we want to do all we can to work with UHI Perth to improve access to these opportunities. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Shires. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Provost, um, uh, and thank you for your uh, your ruling on uh, my point of order. Um, it remains my view uh, that the most appropriate course of action here uh, should be to request to meet at least initially uh, with the principal of the University of Highlands and Islands uh, and then and only if deemed necessary thereafter to uh, to then potentially seek to speak to the correct minister responsible for this area that is the minister for further and higher education and I wonder if uh, the, the movers uh, of the motion might consider uh, that approach uh, to, to this issue. Otherwise, um, I would uh, be minded to uh, raise an amendment to the motion to that effect. 
Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't have any other comments at the moment, so I'm going to come to Councillor Duff um, and Councillor Shires anyway to um, see if they have a reply to that point specifically. Councillor Duff. Uh, sorry, yeah, I'm just finding my <coughs> microphone there. <coughs> so, um, in terms of the outcome of the um, motion, I'm assuming that uh, Councillor Drysdale is asking me to consider a kind of two stage uh, um, part to this in that there is initially a meeting with the principal of University of Highland Islands. And then that could or should be followed up with a meeting with um, the cabinet secretary or the minister uh, in relation to, the, to, to uh, this area of, of uh, education. Would that be correct? Councillor Drysdale is nodding out. Uh, if, if I might, might just seek to clarify for Councillor Duff and others, uh, what, what I'm really saying is that I believe that the uh, uh, the person able, you know, the most appropriate person to approach with regard to this issue is the principal of uh, University of Highlands and Islands. Um, I, and I'm saying that if if that um, that discussion does not bear uh, bear fruit, uh, then there may need to be uh, an approach to the Minister for Higher and Further Education. Uh, and I'm suggesting that two tier approach. OK, thank you. I think for clarity then, I'm just going to explain what I think the final sentence would roughly look like. Um, based on that, if if Councillor Duff isn't minded to accept it or not, this council calls upon the leader to meet with the University of the Highlands and Islands principal. Um, and if necessary, the Further Education Minister, uh, Further and Higher Education Minister, um, to call for additional funding for UHI Perth to prevent these job losses and course cuts. Is that what you are currently asking for, just so we can get clarity for everyone? Yes. Right. OK. Councillor Duff, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, uh, Provost. Um... Could I just have a, a second? Uh, you appreciate I'm obviously at home here. Absolutely. Just no, I do. I appreciate with, that. Uh, if you want to with yeah. Yeah. Just no a couple problem. minutes. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thank you, Provost. Um, <clears throat> I'm content uh, to accept that uh, amendment uh, or the additional part to the um, motion that uh, there should be a meeting with the UHI principal uh, first. Thank you very much, Councillor Duff. Um, <clears throat> I have a comment from Councillor Lane. 
It's just to say uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Duff, for accepting that. And uh, I think if I have a uh, expedite a meeting with uh, either by teams or whatever means with the uh, chair of UHI, uh, it will help me uh, then take a further meeting forward once I understand in more depth the way that the funding uh, uh, settlement that uh, Perth UHI has received from uh, their, the, their overarching UHI body. So thanks for allowing me to uh, gather more information before I go into a meeting with the <coughs> Minister. Um, Councillor Shires, Thank um, you. as the seconder of the motion you've already spoken, is it a point of clarification it is, perhaps? It is promised. Um, I was just uh, going to suggest that perhaps given the comments I made about the anti-poverty task force and, and where Perth College UHI sits within that, that perhaps there might be the opportunity to have a, a cross party meeting with the principal. Um, I'm kind of surprised that hasn't a meeting hasn't already taken place with the college authorities, given the scale of this and the impact across um, education across Perth and Kinross. Um, but that aside, I, I really I think the we cannot underestimate our ambition if we are if we're serious about tackling you know, low wages, unskilled workers, etc. Then we really need to to bolster our partnership with this um, important organisation. So that would be my request: is that is perhaps the, a representative from each of the political parties in in the same model as we have with the anti poverty task force to drive this forward and and to to demonstrate our support for um, this vital partner. Uh, thank you, Councillor Charles, and I would agree with those. Um, comments entirely. Um, I assume that as the uh, seconder of the motion, uh, the proposer of the motion might be minded to um, incorporate that within his terms of the motion. Um, I will Indeed. come back to him in a second. Councillor Peter Barrett with a comment, please. So I don't know whether Councillor Ribbeck was before me. I do apologise. I have I have lost the track there. Councillor John Ribbeck. Um, thank you, Provost. It's just a brief comment, mainly because UHI Perth is in my ward, and I'm proud that it's in my ward. And I know ward colleagues are too, Councillor Massey and Councillor Leishman. I know they are very, also very proud, without speaking for them, to have it in their ward, because it's an important institution for many reasons. And the nursery is excellent. Uh, we know that from anecdote and HMI inspection. It's a dedicated staff and a great outdoor learning space, and it's right as a council we should be supporting that. Um, money is tight and there are many reasons for that. I guess that's a conversation for another time, another day. Personally, I think decisions made further afield than Holyrood are the main cause. But as I say, that's a conversation for another day. And I do think this amendment or the amended motion, if you like, is a pragmatic and sensible solution to that. Thank you, Provost. Thank you, Councillor Redick, um, and thank you, Councillor Barrett, for giving me right. Now, Councillor Barrett to speak. Yeah, thanks, Provost. I, I do think that the public expect their councillors to be able to separate the wood from the, 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 the trees, um, and we do seem to have kind of uh, largely lost the ability to, 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 to do that. Um, and I don't think that we are conducting politics in a very edifying um, fashion, uh, uh, the, given proceedings um, this morning and the fact that we've now spent 35 minutes on a motion that could have been probably and properly debated in about half that time you know, simply by putting forward um, a, 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 a competition. Um, a, a amendment. I think it is important um, that we uh, uh, defend uh, our educational institutes uh, and the educational opportunities for people that live in Kinross uh, and also the economic benefits that derive from having uh, a university at the heart of our, our, our city centre. And I think we should have been focused uh, on the bigger picture uh, instead of quibbling about which cabinet minister we were writing to or whether we were requesting or calling on uh, a, a meeting uh, with the relevant cabinet. Minister, it does seem to me like a twin track approach with both the uh, uh, the UHI principal uh, and the, the relevant um, Scottish Government Minister uh, is the best way to proceed so that there is political pressure uh, being applied both locally and nationally uh, to come to the uh, best outcome for uh, learners in Perth and Kinross. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Um, I don't see any other contributions, so Councillor oh, Brian Leishman. Thank you, Provost. In the December budget, uh, then Deputy First Minister John Swinney announced £20 million worth of additional revenue investment for universities and £26 million worth for colleges. He said 
We must have a skills, training and research environment that enables our people and businesses to realise their potential. But then, less than six months later, high ed higher education has been deprioritised by the Scottish Government and told that the monies are needed elsewhere. Universities and colleges were relying on that £46 million promise in the budget, a budget that was passed by Holyrood. And the following is not the words of an opposition politician. The Scottish Government needs a plan for universities, staff and students. It cannot keep expecting to have world-class universities on the cheap. A flat cash funding settlement amid high inflation leaves the sector facing managed decline. Those are the words of Professor Dame Sally Mapstone, the convener of University Scotland. And when thinking about the crisis, it really has been years in the making. The SNP has embraced the Thatcher ideals of marketisation and competition in further education by developing structures and processes that bypass public accountability. That even trickled down to the staff at UHI Perth Nursery being told that they were going to close and that staff would lose their jobs. There was no consultation process. A completely callous way to treat workers and their communities. And thankfully, the decision to close the nursery has been reversed, although for now it's a temporary reprieve. Staff were told of the reversal at the same time I was there speaking to the nursery manager. The relief that staff weren't losing their jobs was not the first emotion they had. Staff spoke of the happiness they felt because it meant that the children they look after wouldn't have upheaval and parents wouldn't be in a panic looking for alternative options at short notice. That selflessness shows the quality of staff that look after and nurture the children that attend the nursery. And staff aren't the only victims of this government's policy of underfunding. Students are also suffering, especially working class students from low income families. They deserve the same opportunities as everyone else. How does the SNP expect us to recover from the devastation of a pandemic that has compounded the already appalling inequalities and growing gaps in Scottish society? By cutting funding to further education. Further education is a vehicle for social mobility. It increases skills. It provides a route out of poverty. Education is a right and we all benefit when it is properly funded. Cutting its funding is already dreadful, but multiply that tenfold when the cuts come at a time where high inflation doggedly persists, food prices keep on rising, energy bills are scandalous and people are being bombarded by the cost of living crisis. What world does the SNP government think we are living in? That the various strands of poverty we see are not linked because they are very much are linked. For tackling poverty to be the inverted commas key priority for this government, then it needs a drastic rethink on its funding of further education. Further education is vital for those that experience barriers to education, and it must be invested in, not decimated by reductions and cuts. Colleges and universities are already cash strapped. There will need to be cuts to courses with a reduction in the offering available to students due to a lack of Scottish Government funding, and skilled lecturers and staff will be lost. Let's call these SNP cuts what they are. Removing £46 million of funding is unadulterated austerity. At least the Tories are up front about the savage cuts they make in the name of austerity. The SNP are in denial. They try to blame somewhere else and kid everyone on that they are stronger for Scotland. Thank you, Councillor Leishman. Councillor Forbes. Yeah, thanks, Provost. I find myself in the odd situation of agreeing with both uh, Councillor Leishman and Councillor Barrett, but I want to just go back to Councillor Barrett's point. And I think today, I really don't think we as a council have done ourselves any favours. We heard earlier on there was a miswording in Councillor Frampton's motion. Um, we've had uh, something slip through the net in a previous motion, which I think was uh, Councillor Duff's. And, and as Councillor Shire said just a second ago, we've had a, a select cabal of people minus the mover and the seconder of, of a motion to discuss the matter. It's not the inclusive council that we've heard about earlier on today. As I said a minute ago, I don't think we've, as a council, have done ourselves any favours today. And, and if people are looking on it, as I think they'll be looking on in shock and horror. And I think all of us in this room should reflect on all of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Councillor Forbes. Um, I think we will all reflect on the fact that we can all always do better um, and that we all need to engage with each other for the good of people in Perth and Kinross. Um, Mr Leader, you have already spoken in this debate, so I'm afraid I'm not going to allow you to come in again. Uh, Councillor Duff, to sum up, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost. 
and just finding my wee bit here. Yeah, um, as has already been mentioned, UHI Perth is an important institution in the fabric of our society and a thriving university is vital for the city of Perth. The loss of 50 jobs as well as the loss of courses and students is a major blow for the city and something which we must make every effort to rectify if we are serious about tackling poverty, promoting lifelong learning and enabling our young people to achieve the full potential. I'm grateful to members for support of this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Members, are we content to agree the revised motion? Thank you very much. Um, members, I'm just going to check at this point whether anyone wishes a brief comfort break or whether they feel the recess has provided them the comfort break they required. I would quite like to finish the business, if possible. OK, thank you. Item six is the annual Treasury report um, and Stuart McKenzie, the head of finance, is going to introduce the report. Thank you, Provost, and good afternoon, councillors. As members will recall, the Council approved the Treasury and Investment Strategy for the current financial year, 2023-24, at its meeting in May. This strategy will guide Treasury and investment activity over the coming months, in line with the financing of the Council's capital expenditure. The paper before you today looks backwards at actual experience against the approved Treasury and Investment Strategy for last financial year, 2022-23. And information within the support has previously been reflected when the quarterly Treasury reports to the Finance and Resources Committee, and members will be familiar with the economic environment over the past 12 months, so I'll focus on the key points. The Council undertook significant borrowing to support the delivery of the capital budget towards the end of 2021, when rates fell to historic lows. No new long-term borrowing was therefore required in 2022-23, and the repayment of £8 million of maturing debt, so the Council's long-term debt reduced to £603.3 million pounds at the 31st of March, as set out in the table in Section 4 of the report. I would, however, stress that this is a temporary situation, as the Council has a significant new borrowing requirement of over £570 million pounds over the next five years to deliver the approved capital budget. The Treasury strategy last year anticipated an increase in borrowing rates over the course of 2022-23 and, in the absence of new borrowing, assumed the managed use of the Council's temporary investment balances to help finance the capital programme. And the Council's total investments accordingly reduced from £252 million at the beginning of the year to £173.7 million at the end of March in line with the strategy. What was not anticipated was the scale of increase in borrowing rates given persistently high inflation and the global economic disruption caused by the war in Ukraine. And members will be familiar with the consecutive increases in UK bank rate, which now stands at 5%. Rates for long-term borrowing from the Public Works Loans Board, which finances most local authority borrowing, also increased markedly over the course of the year, as shown in Appendix 1 to the report. 50-year PWLB borrowing rates were 2.37% in April 2022 and closed the year at 4.41% in March 2023. And given the Council's substantial borrowing requirement over the next few years, the increase in PWLB rates will have a significant impact on the cost of financing the capital programme going forward. Whilst the level of temporary investments reduced over the course of the year, the Council did, however, benefit from improved investment returns. Total interest receivable on investment activity in 2022-23 amounted to £6.469 million, compared to £1.546 million in the previous year. To conclude, there were no breaches in compliance with either the Treasury or Investment Strategy, and the improvement in investment returns, combined with no new long-term borrowing, reduced the Council's Consolidated Loans Fund rate, a measure of overall Treasury performance in relation to borrowing costs, from 3.11% to 2.67% in 
Happy to take questions, Provost. Thank you, Mr. McKenzie. Councillor Donaldson, please. Thank you, Provost. Um, can I ask Stuart McKenzie just one question? Um, clearly, the report covers the position to 31st of March. I think it's important that we're up with events and it's now three months on. Um, clearly, you know, there's been improvements and it will come to finance and resources in uh, September in terms of our reserves position and our overall position in the Council. But can I ask specifically, Stuart, especially given the events of last week, what is the current certainty rate on 50 year money now compared to 4.41 at the end of March? And for borrowing 1 million, how much does that now impact on uh, our revenue account? Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Dawson, for the question. Thank you for the advance notice of the question, which has allowed me to, to refresh my, my memory on these figures. Um, the, the current certainty rate on 50-year money as of this morning is 4.85%. And members will be aware it's a spot rate. We, we get two iterations of that rate each day. The figures I'm, I'm going to share are based on a couple of days ago when the rate was 4.9%. So there's really not, not much difference. So the... The, if the council were to borrow one million pounds over 50 years from the PWLB and assuming a rate of a couple of days ago 4.9 percent that would cost 49,000 pounds per annum in interest and to give members a sense of the movement and the impact in rates one year ago the rate was 3.2 percent and the equivalent cost per annum in interest for £1 million pounds was £32,000 per year over a 50 year period. So when you start to multiply that difference out over the period of a loan, which in this case would be 50 years, that's a significant increase in the cost of borrowing a £1 million. Pounds. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Bailey Bailey next, please. Thank you, Provost, and um, thank you for the previous question, Councillor Donaldson. I think um, this question could be seen as sort of layperson's view on that, because obviously the Bank of England, as we're all aware, raised the base rate a little more than markets perhaps expected them to last week. Um, does that still leave officers with the confidence that, um, that we're on track here, or does it give any concern in terms of future borrowing costs? I think just looking for a summary of maybe the answer you gave previously with regard to whether last week's decision was within what you'd planned for, or whether that puts us outside of the margins that are in this paper. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Bailey Bailey. Um, there was an expectation um, that that the base rate, sorry, the bank rate would increase um, last week. Um, it's increased, as you said, slightly more than market expectations were. Um, we we receive a forecast, and it's no more than a forecast from our Treasury advisors. And the expectation had been that we wouldn't see rates, PWLB rates, which is our primary focus, much below 4% um, coming into 2024. That's now been revised to nothing much below 4% going into 2025. So it's really just an awkward in terms of every t there's not a direct relationship between our borrowing costs and the bank rate, but inevitably the, the things catch up. So every time the bank rate goes up, that just pushes back the period at which we'd expect to see council borrowing rates effectively go down. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Bailey Ahern next, please. Thank you very much. My question is on paragraph 8.3 about investments um, and this is from a layperson trying to understand the what was said in that paragraph it says there about shorter investment periods money market funds held by the council provide a higher return on investment than rebates are available on other accounts up to three months um, so part of the question is if if the investment above three months is a better rate do we then put more money into those slightly longer terms of investment? But then it says further down in the, in the paragraph, 
As, ve as investment rates increase, short-term fixed deposit rates also become more attractive relative to other accounts. I'm not quite understanding that. So if the interest rates for longer accounts between three and 12 increase, do the short ones between naught and three months increase at the same rate? And, or is there a, a point where slightly longer is better? Or, or just if you could give us a bit more explanation on the interest rates. Thank you for your question, Billy Ahern, and I do appreciate it. I'm the only thing standing between elected members and lunch, so I'll try and keep what's quite a, a complex area relatively straightforward, if I may. What we saw last year was rates, both in terms of the council putting out money for a short period of time and a longer period of time, increase uh, over, over the course of the past 12 months. How we, we put money out in a temporary investment, and bear in mind the council is borrowing effectively for capital expenditure. So it it's just shifts in our cash flow and variations in our cash flow, but sometimes we have money which we can put out for a few months, and then we need the money back to meet our cash flow requirements. Sometimes we can invest for, for a longer period of time. So we've effectively looking at two, two related markets. One is the market for short term money, that might just be a few days. And um, one is the mar market for longer term money where the council might be investing for up to a year, sometimes a year in, in advance of a year. Well, we didn't do that last year. What happened last year is both those markets were fairly buoyant, but we tended to invest over a longer period of time where we could because the returns are higher because the perceived risk of having money out for a longer period of time is greater. So you, you tend to get more money if you invest it for a longer period of time. So, apologies if that's a little bit opaque, but that's essentially what happened. The rates increased in both of those areas. We invest effectively in both markets based on our cash flow, but we shifted more money into longer term investment because that's what gets us a better rate of return where we could. Can I help? Councillor Liz Barrett. Thank you, Provost. Um, it's mine, mine is a comment rather than a question. Um, I do apologise. I had added you on my list. I'll let the Leader of the Council move the motion. I'll come back to you for shortly. Uh, thanks, Provost. Uh, Provost, this report before Council today in accordance with our approved Treasury management practice. The report covers the Council's Treasury position as well as wider commentary on activity during 2022-2023. Throughout 2022-23, the Finance and Resources Committee has received detailed quarterly updates on tre Treasury management activity. Those quarterly updates provided members of the Finance and Resources Committee with the opportunity to scrutinise and comment on Treasury management activity. Today, this annual Treasury report provides all elected members with a summary of 2022-23 activity. Once again, I'm pleased to note that there were no breaches of compliance with Council's approved borrowing and investment policies and strategy in 2022-23. All aspects of the Prudential Code, including Prudential indicators and limits, were also fully adhered to throughout the year. Our proactive approach to Treasury management has also delivered significant investment returns to the Council. A paragraph 8.4, we are advised of investment income of almost 6.5 million, which will help support council activity. I also welcome the con council's consolidated loans fund rate for 2022-23, reduced to 2.67% because of our proactive treasury activity, which has delivered savings to the revenue budget. Provost, I'm happy to move this report. Thank you. And Councillor Drysdale to second, please. Happy to second. Thank you very much, Councillor Drysdale. Apologies, Councillor Liz Barrett, to come back to your comment now. Thank you, Provost. Um, Mr McKenzie has referred to the impacts of the war in Ukraine on inflation and interest rates, but I think we're all also very aware that the UK situation has been exacerbated by the impacts of Brexit and the legacy impact on global confidence in the UK of the disastrous so-called mini-budget by the Conservative government under Liz Truss last year. I'd like to thank Mr Jennings and Mr McKenzie for this report and thank everyone involved in our tre Treasury management functions in tackling the complex challenges that are presented 
by these situations and the decisions we've taken on our revenue and capital budgets. Thank you all. Thank you, Councillor Barrett. Councillor Donaldson. Switched off, oh, sorry. Thank you, Provost. Flat cash, flat cash, as now seems to be the new narrative from the Conservatives. Could I just suggest there's another word they might, the Tories might want to add into their lexicon? It's flatlining, and it's flatlining of the UK economy. And I think after last week's events, both on inflation and on interest rates, flatlining may be, even be the least of it. There's a real danger that we could be entering into a recession. And we've got to take these factors into account. Uh, in particular on inflation, what really was concerning was not just CPI was 8.7%, retail price index 11.3 but we saw an actual despite the the prime minister stating it's a, a, a clear priority for him we saw core inflation rise from 6.8 percent in april to 7.1 percent and it's going against the trend in other developed economies in the united states uh, inflation is now down to 4%. It may even be heading to 3% in a month's time or near to that. In the Eurozone, it's not quite as good at 6.1%, but that's still down from 7% in April. But I think you can see the direction of travel. But as one commentator put it, UK inflation isn't just stubborn or sticky, it's stuck. And you can advance various reasons for why that's happened. The Ukraine and the war there. But the, that's a factor that's affected most other developed economies and has really had a big impact in, in, in economies in, in Africa and parts of Asia in terms of food inflation. You could blame it on the pandemic. But Councillor Barrett referred to Brexit. And yes, I think that is a key factor. And I just refer to the report in uh, last Sunday's uh, in the Herald last Sunday, Ian McConnell, their business editor, who hasn't always been uh, supportive of the Scottish Government. Uh, incidentally, in that report, he does point out just the extent to which Scotland has become, and last year in 2022, for foreign direct investment, was the best location in the UK outside of London. I think that's something you never hear about, and that's the Ernst Young, the EY report. But what he was referring to was in particular the recent comments by the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. And I think they are very apposite indeed. And uh, Carney was quite clear that uh, Brexit uh, provided a central banker speak perhaps a negative supply shock for a period of time and the consequence of that will be a weaker pound, higher inflation and weaker growth. That's what he said in, uh, in 2016 and that is exactly how it's turned out. Uh, there really are though the consequences of Thank that. Councillor Donson. Is, is, I, 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 think, will, I think there is a point to the relevance. The, I, th I think it is entirely relevant because I asked more. the question a minute ago about uh, borrowing costs and the major, you know, we may very well see a uh, bank rate increase for further from 5% to possibly 6% and above. That is something we've got to factor into our budget process conceivably come this autumn. It may be it's higher inflation, it could be higher borrowing costs for the council, and it's also the mortgage crisis. And that is something, you know, we, we, we are being concerned about the cost of living crisis, uh, and in particular for tenants and for those in the private rented sector. That is an issue now we may have to address for those who are purchasing their own homes. 
uh, and that is going to be, I think, important going forward. I do think, I think it's entirely relevant on inflation and on interest rates that that we've got to see things in the full context. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Thanks, Provost. I, I will be brief. I just want to pick up on uh, what Councillor Barrett said about uh, interest rates. And as Councillor Donaldson has said, they are actually higher in Europe. And that's we, we can't continue to blame Brexit for absolutely everything that's happened. I didn't vote for Brexit, but I think we just need to move on from that. And to Councillor Donaldson, I'd say that I just remind him politely that the SNP's policy is to leave the UK to keep the pound, but have absolutely no political control over that or the interest rates at all. Um, and he also referenced uh, the private rental sector. And I'd just Slightly point out to him that's another area that the SNP with their, their green friends have completely trashed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Forbes. Councillor Lingworth. Uh, uh, thank you, Provost. Uh, a quick comment just to say that if Councillor Donaldson thinks that separating from the EU is a very bad idea, why does he think that separating from the United Kingdom, where we have common borders, common language, common everything, where we have a fiscal transfer of 10 billion pounds a year and where we do 6% of our trade is a very good idea? Sorry to interrupt. Okay, okay thank you. A uh, point of clarification to Bailey Bailey, please. Thank you. Um, it's just in response to something Councillor Forbes said, um, I was surprised to hear that he um, said he voted against Brexit when I'm sure I had leaflets through his door in 2019 saying he was Boris Johnson's candidate to get Brexit done and had an oven ready Brexit. Thank you. OK, I think we're going to finish here. Um, are we happy to agree the report? Thank you. Item seven, proposed changes to the scheme of administration. Uh, the team leader from committee services would like to speak to this item. Thank you, Provost. It's just to say that um, the changes in relation to the Executive Subcommittee of Learning and Families Committee and also the Property Subcommittee are not significant changes. We are already doing these in practice, so it's just to formally have this mentioned in the scheme. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, are we content to go? Oh, Councillor Liz Barrett, I'm sorry, I'm so fast off the mark there. Councillor Liz Barrett, you have a point of clarification. Sorry, 21.4 seems to have journal in the middle of it. Could that be fixed, please? Thank you. Thank you. OK, members, are we happy to agree the proposed changes to the scheme of administration? Thank you very much. Members, item eight, elect member briefing notes. Are we happy to note the briefing notes that have been issued to elect members since the last council meeting on the 10th of May as set out on the agenda? Uh, Councillor Colin Stewart. Um, thanks, Provost. I was just, um, I'm grateful to see that um, we've had the elect member briefing notes issued um, outlining the um, projects uh, which are taking place as um, estate based initiative improvements. Um, I previously asked for um, a, a consolidated uh, internally for a consolidated list for uh, the north locality, so I think it's helpful to have these. I just wondered um, whether um, the relevant uh, director or head of service might um, uh, arrange a session just on the process for selecting the projects. I understand how the the process for um, analysing the the or, or or gathering the input works, um, but for actually for the actual selection of the projects, um, I, and I would just have some questions over the ones that had been selected, particularly in my locality, but it might be helpful for members to understand that process. Thank you. I think that can be agreed. Yeah, um, officers will take that away and action that. Uh, Barbara Rent, you wish to happy come in and provide clarity on that? Yeah, happy to do that, Provost, in line with Councillor Stewart's request. Uh, thank you very much. OK, and uh, I have a point of clarification from Councillor McEwen. Provost, we published the letters that the, that the leader writes on behalf of this council. And is that going to happen the same as our request for meetings? 
as it seems to be now, it's meetings we're having rather than letters. Uh, sorry, just to get clarity there, um, your question is, will we publish the letters that, and the answers? Your question is whether we're going to publish the, the requests. Uh, I don't see any issue why we wouldn't. Um, I think I'm happy to agree that on behalf of the collective here. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, members, that concludes today's business. Thank you for your attendance.